Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the scriptures teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, let's get going again on our fourth program, and we are in Book 51, the first four programs, and that's what the last number means. And uh, hopefully... Uh, I don't know where we'll end up in Hebrews, whether we'll finish all of uh, book 51 or what, but we'll take it as it comes. It's hard to uh, program ahead of time. Again, we'd like to welcome all of you out there in television, and again, we'd like to thank you for your letters. Yes, we still read every letter, and uh, we, uh, that's why we appreciate don't make them too long. <laughs> Keep them short, <laughs> and uh, that way we can... Uh, read them all and still not take an overly amount of our time. But we do thank you and for your help, your prayers, everything. Uh, we just can't do it without it. Okay, I think that's enough of announcements. We're going to get right back where we left off. I didn't quite finish my thoughts on Hebrews 9:28, even though Jerry's got 10 verse 1 up on the board. We'll be there in a second. But let's go back to verse 28 for a second, honey. Hebrews 9, Verse 28 again, <clears throat> so Christ was once, there it is again, see, for Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and we went back in our last half hour and looked at that, that was all, the whole human race. And unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Now, of course, what Paul is referring to is that when Christ returns at the end of the tribulation, those that have embraced him throughout the gospel of the kingdom in that seven years of tribulation and have survived, they're going to see him coming, and he will come without sin unto salvation. Now, what I feel... Paul is addressing here is that you see at his first advent he came for what purpose? To die for the sins of the world. And then 2 Corinthians 5 says so plainly that he was made sin for us. He who knew no sin. Not the next time. He's not going to come to pay any sin debt the next time. When he comes the second time it will be in wrath and judgment, and then establishing his heaven on earth kingdom. And I think that's what's referring to here, that he'll come the second time without sin unto salvation. All right, now let's move on into chapter 10. <clears throat> come right back again to the Mosaic system. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, you remember I gave you an illustration of shadows a program or two back. You got a big, beautiful, tall tree, and it casts a shadow. Well, you can't get all that much from the shadow. It can give you an idea, but that's about all. Well, that's what the law was. The law really didn't have anything of any intrinsicness for us, except that it was a foreshadowing of that which was to come. All right, so the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of things. You know, I've probably upset people once in a while, and I don't do it purposely. But, you know, the Old Testament believers, somebody likes to tell me that they understood that it was the cross, the burial, and resurrection. How could they? I got Abraham for one. Abraham believed God. And his believing was accounted in for righteousness. And then they try to tell me that Abraham understood that Christ would die on a cross. No, he had no concept of that. How could he? The cross was a Roman invention that didn't come for hundreds and hundreds of years later. But what little God revealed to Abraham, he believed. And God accounted it to him for righteousness. And so here again, the law was just a shadow 
Oh, even, even the rabbis and the priests, they understood that there were things here that they weren't comprehending. A verse comes to mind. Turn, we've looked at it before, but it's been a while. Come over with me to 1 Peter. And Peter, again, is addressing Jews too, you know. He's writing to the strangers scattered abroad, which are Jews. But you come into chapter 1, 1 Peter. And this is what we mean by it was just a shadow. Oh, there were things back in that Old Testament that the religious leaders of Israel knew there was something that they weren't comprehending. All right, you got 1 Peter chapter 1. Oh, my goodness. Let's go in verse 7. Let's lead up to it in verse 7. Someday, if the Lord tarries, we'll be finishing Hebrews, and then I guess we'll go on into the little epistles of James. Some of you have already been asking. There's your answer. We'll probably go on into James and uh, 1 and 2 Peter, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, and Jude. And uh, then, of course, I'm open to suggestions as to what will follow. We'll go back to the minor prophets. I've got Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Oh, my goodness, we've got a long ways to go. I could live to be 500. <laughs> and uh, we'd never finish it. But all right, here in 1 Peter, chapter 1, verse 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Whom? Speaking of Jesus Christ. Whom? Having not seen, you love. In whom, though now you see him not yet believing, you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your soul. See there again, even Peter is emphasizing the faith aspect. All right, now verse 10. Of which? Of which what? Salvation. Of which salvation the prophets have what? Inquired. What does that mean? They asked a ton of questions. They were questioning. And they searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come. Hadn't come yet, but they understood that there was something coming and they searched and they tried their dead level best to put the whole thing together, and they could not. Now, you know, many times throughout the last years we've been on television, I have gone back to Rachel's death at the birth of little Benjamin. And I think most of you are aware, as she was a dying, what did she say the little fella's name would be? Ben oh my, which meant what? The son of my suffering. She was dying. But old Jacob overruled it, and he says, no, no, we're not going to call him ben Omar. We're going to call him Benjamin, or we call it Benjamin, which meant the son of strength. Well, now what do you suppose the rabbis did with that? Well, there's something here. This didn't just happen by accident. Surely there's going to be two messiahs, one who will suffer, and they understood Isaiah 53, that he would be led as a lamb to the slaughter, and they could put that much together. So evidently the ben Omai was a suffering Messiah. But then along comes Benjamin and renames the little lad Benjamin, a son of strength. And the Old Testament is full of a king and his kingdom. So that Messiah must be the king. So maybe there are going to be two. Well, that was logical up to a point. But what did they never put together? One and the same, but in two different times, separated now at least by 2,000 years. We hope it won't be much more. And that they could never comprehend, that the ben Omai was Christ's first advent, the suffering Messiah. Now, nearly 2,000 years later, we trust that soon, the Benjamin aspect is coming, and what is he going to be? The king. See how beautiful it all is? 
But these Old Testament people never figured it out. They never figured it out. Most Jews today still haven't. Boy, Iris had a nice phone call the other day from a Jew. Boy, he says, I'm with him all the way. And uh, I don't like to express the good comments we get, but I, I do. I get good comments from Jewish people, and even from a rabbi once in a while. And, uh, and we do. We appreciate that. But see, these rabbis just didn't have an understanding. They saw the shadow. But like I gave you in my analogy, you don't build a piece of furniture with a shadow. You've got to have the tree. And all they could pick up was the shadow. There's something. All right, read on. Verse 11, searching, searching. Now, if you understand yeshivas in Israel's educational system, that's all those young men do. From morning till night, they just sit there and they do nothing but analyze the Old Testament, searching to see if they can come up with some little tidbit of revelation that somebody else hasn't ever seen. All right, now these old fellows were doing the same thing. They were searching the Old Testament. Searching what? Or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ, the ben Omar, and the what? The glory which should follow, the Benjamin, the king, the kingdom. Verse 12, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us. Peter, speaking now after the fact, they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them who have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Spirit sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. But the point I want to make, Peter is so clear and adamant here that these Old Testament rabbis saw the shadow, but they could not construct the whole picture because God was keeping it secret. Now, it takes me back to a verse in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 29, 29, honey. Deuteronomy 29, 29. I've given a dear, dear friend of mine who was in my class for a long time. Their health is now deteriorated. Liesl and Pat will know who I'm talking about. But dear old Dr. Baker came up one night and he said, Les, I found a verse that fits your teaching to a T. And I'd never seen it before. And here it is. Oh, I've thanked the Lord for him over the years. This is a long time ago. Because see, this just opened. This just opened everything. Deuteronomy 29, 29. The secret things. What things? Secret. Now listen, secrets are secrets. And when it's a secret, how many people know about it? Nobody but one. Nobody but one. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. Nobody else. But, flip side, those things which are revealed that are no longer secret, see? So those things which are revealed belong unto us, Moses is writing, and to our children forever that we may do all the words. What's the verse telling us? That God keeps things secret until he reveals it. And he's not going to reveal it all at once. He's going to reveal little by little. And so all the way up through Scripture, God is revealing things that he has kept secret. And that's why a lot of the prophecies back in the Old Testament were hard, even for Bible scholars, to comprehend. God didn't expect them to. There was no need for it. What good would it have done to start preaching prophecy back there at 1000 A.D.? There was no need for it. Even at 1500 A.D., there was still no need for it. But as we approached the 1900s, all of a sudden Bible scholars began to see the picture of the end time coming together. Well, that's the way God works. 
But see, the Apostle Paul over and over is making mention of that. Now let me take you back to what Paul says. Let's go to Romans, honey. Romans chapter 16. Romans 16. Now don't forget what we just read in Deuteronomy. God keeps things secret. And until he reveals it, that's what they are. But once he reveals it, he expects mankind to believe it. Romans 16, verse 25. One of my favorite verses. And I'll usually ask my seminar crowds, how many of you have ever heard a sermon preached on Romans 16, 25? Well, until last fall in Minnesota, I never got a hand. <laughs> last fall, I finally got two or three. But see, people don't hear this. They don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. But look what it says. Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept, what? Secret. See how plain that is? Well, what was secret about it? In Christ's earthly ministry, Peter, James, and John, and the rest had no idea that God would turn to the Gentile world with this gospel of grace. They had no concept of such a thing. The only mindset they had was that once Israel was converted, yes, then Israel could move out and bring the Gentiles in. But see, I'm always emphasizing back there in their earthly ministry, and we won't take time to look the verses up, but what did Jesus tell the twelve as they began their earthly ministry? Go not into the way of a Gentile. Any house of Samaritans enter you not, but go only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Hey, what was that? That was something that was still kept secret from the Gentile world. They weren't to go and reveal anything to Gentile. One time for it. And so Peter, James, and John and the rest, they know nothing of going to Gentile. You know, I always like to come back to Peter in the house of Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. Now you see, that was probably seven, eight, nine years after Pentecost, and they've been situated only in Jerusalem all those years. You don't believe me? Read Acts 8 verse 1. They were all scattered abroad everywhere except the apostles. They weren't about to leave. But finally, after Saul's conversion in chapter 9 and chapter 10, God providentially forced Peter to go up to this Gentile house of Cornelius. And you've heard me say it more than once, heel prints in the sand. Peter didn't want to go to those pagan Gentile, no more than Jonah did. But he got there. And God did something that those Jews couldn't comprehend. What did he do? Save that house full of Romans. Now we don't know how many there were. Couldn't have been hundreds because it was a, a house. But anyway, the point I always make, wouldn't you think that after seeing the miraculous salvation of a bunch of Roman military men, that Peter would have just sent a messenger back to Jerusalem and said, fellas, I'm out of here. God is going to take the gospel to the Gentiles. I'll see you later. Is that what happened? No. He treks right back to Jerusalem as though nothing had ever happened. And when they got there, they chewed him out royally. What business did you have going into Gentile? Isn't that funny that people can't understand that? Why? Because this whole concept of going to Gentiles with this gospel of grace was still kept secret. Now along comes the Apostle Paul, and what's the first thing God tells him? He's going to send you far hence to the Gentiles. Unheard of. Unheard of. Those pagan Gentiles, that's where I'm going to send you. All right, now look what Paul writes in Galatians. Galatians chapter 1. And oh, this is such simple language. Such simple language. Galatians 1, starting at verse 11. My, we've used these verses, especially in my Oklahoma classes. Most of you people that come on Friday night, you've heard this maybe not too long ago. Galatians 1, verse 11. Look what the apostle writes by the inspiration of the Spirit. 
But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which is preached of me, or what he called in Romans, my gospel, is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, that is, by other men, but by the revelation. Now, when you let go of a secret, what are you doing? You're revealing it. See? And so this secret that's been in the mind of God, God's revealing to the Apostle Paul. And again, not all at once, little by little. All right, so he says, I got it by revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, what I just pointed out to someone who called over the phone as to where I stand concerning Christ's earthly ministry, and I just made it real plain. I said, look, Christ's earthly ministry was under the law. It was directed to the children of Israel, and I quoted him Romans 15, verse 8. Now, I say that Jesus Christ was the minister of the circumcision, for the truth of God to fulfill the promises made to the fathers. Plain English, isn't it? All right, so he ministered to the nation of Israel under the law, leading up to the crucifixion. But this man, this man now has things revealed from the ascended Lord. What does that mean? The work of the cross is finished. Whole new ballgame. Now we're ready to reveal some secrets. And now read on. For you have heard of my conversation or manner of living in times past in the Jews' religion. Now you know he was a religious zealot. And how the beyond measure I persecuted the assembly of God. Now that wasn't the body of Christ he's talking about. Those were Jewish believers in Jerusalem that he was after. I profited in the Jews' religion, verse 14, above many my equals in my own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. He was religious. But, but, flip side, God pulled him out of that religion. And when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among who? The Gentiles, the heathen. First time this has ever been mentioned, a revelation of a what? Something held secret. All right, read on. Neither. Neither, verse 17, went I up to Jerusalem to them who were apostles before me. Now, some of you have heard me teach this a hundred times. What would have been the logical thing for the Apostle Paul to do? Recently, Saul of Tarsus, the great persecutor, now struck down by the Lord from heaven outside the Damascus gate and told, you're going to go to the Gentile world with my new good news, the gospel. What would have been the logical thing to do? traipse back to Jerusalem and find the twelve and just say, fellas, sit down with me. Let's get out pencil and pad, and I want you to tell me everything you know about this Jesus of Nazareth. Well, what does the scripture say? God did the opposite. Sent him the other direction so that he couldn't sit down with the twelve. Now, that tells me something. He didn't want the twelve muddying this fresh new mind recently bought from religious tradition. And so he sends him out into the desert, the opposite direction. So he says, I neither went up to Jerusalem who were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia. All right, what was the whole purpose? To unload on this man things that have been kept secret. And he's over and over referring to them now then as the revelation of these mysteries or things that had been kept secret. All right, there's another one in Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3. Same kind of a concept. And don't ever accuse the Apostle Paul of being an egotist or being puffed up he was the most humble of servants. He was the most, what shall I say, used of God of any man other than Christ himself. And, of course, we don't compare him to that. 
But I think the Apostle Paul stands head and shoulders even above Moses as God's man for taking the good news to the human race. Now verse 1 of Ephesians 3. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you, what people? Gentiles. And remember, that was a hated word in Israel. For you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given to me, to you word. Now, I know there are some that will agree with a certain part of mine, but they'll say, well, he said, not all of this was kept secret. That was just maybe the body of Christ. Now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. When we get a new administration in Washington, does half of the old group go out or all of them? All of them. It's the whole idea of a transition. The old goes out and the new comes in. When we have a new administration, half the cabinet doesn't stay with the old. They all move out. So an administration is the whole, not just part. All right, now look what the apostle says here in this second verse. This administration of the grace of God was given to me, to you, or not half of it, not just parts of it, all of it. Now, you remember my programs in days gone by. What have I called it? That whole body of truth that is involved in the gospel of the grace of God was that which was revealed in this dispensation or administration of the grace of God. All of it. The beginning of the body of Christ, the end of the body of Christ. And that's why I adamantly say the church cannot go into the tribulation because that dispensation does not fit with Israel. It won't. It can't. Because the whole body of truth was revealed to this man. Secret, now revealed. And oh, God expects us, like he told Moses, that when I reveal it, he expects us to believe it. All right, now if you think he's stretching the point, look what the Holy Spirit inspires him to read. All the way down to verse 9. That now it's up to him that all men can see the fellowship of the secret, that's the other word for mystery, which from the beginning of the world has been what? Hid in what? God. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries. 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552. Or call 1-800-369-7856. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Feldick.